found. Oh, uh, I, I made per- that shirt. Did you make yes. it? I couldn't remember I who, who made it. But I remember, oh, like, when I got this, I was so happy because I didn't have a Candy Sancho shirt. So you can st- it's, it's still in pretty good condition. You know, I didn't try to wear it out. And I uh, didn't cut the sleeves off like some redneck or whatever. But I thought that was really cool. And, of course, I pulled out, like, all the summer. So, so I did the artwork for this. This picture is from a DC show. This is from the the, the, uh, the club was called the Metro, and I booked the Candy Snatchers there with my band Adam West, and my dad was there. My dad used to come to a lot of the shows uh, when he lived in Baltimore, so he actually took this picture of Larry uh, on stage, which is a kind of a ubiquitous picture. Larry constantly on the cover of a lot of these seven inches I'm going to show uh, is bleeding from his forehead. And uh, when Bump and Silas from Black Lung decided to do it, they said, "Hey, can you do the artwork for this collection?" So I did the artwork for this, and uh, it was really cool. You know, they sent me a picture of, like, all of these uh, seven did inches and, and cool things. Catchers Adam West split. My band was Adam West. Um, Larry's other band at the time, The Crumbs, I did their first EP as well because Larry and I became, you know, really good friends. Uh, and so I did a lot of stuff to help them out. Uh, I know I was the first one to bring them to Washington, D.C. because this town is a completely non-rock and roll town, and... They couldn't get a gig here, you know, no one would book them, and so I was like, well, shit, I'm going to book them and bring Nashville Pussy, Electric Frankenstein, all these bands, try to do that, to turn DC into some kind of rock scene. I think I was successful for a couple of years, and of course it died again, but nevertheless, um, <laughs> you know, if you want to get some, some yeah. B footage of some, of some of this crap. I feel like I should hide this somewhere, <laughs> so it doesn't mess up your name. Oh, <laughs> well, we could put it behind here if yeah. you want to get into the picture. <laughs> Well, this is the first one, and then the very rare Pinto Pony, and then this is the Fuck My Family that Jeff Dahl did, and then it just kind of goes from there. Um, this is the really cool 5-inch one that had the live stuff. I think this might have been the first one that uh, Bump and Silas did on Black Lung for them, mm-hmm. which, which one of my favorite, uh, favorite drawings. I was going to say, you should go from the 5, 6, 7, 8 through that one. Okay. They have quite a discography. Um, And in my opinion, um, a lot of their best material ended up on singles and not necessarily on their albums. And since my, I think the 45, the 7 inch is the coolest music medium. Uh, I think that if you can put two songs on a, on a 45 uh, that can change someone's life, uh, to me, that's just, I don't know. I just grew up with the 45. I love the 7 inch. And, um, I think the Candy Snatchers did an amazing job of just putting some incredible songs only on vinyl, only on 7-inch. Uh, a lot of them were collected later in compilations. But um, here's the one that I did on Fandango. And what I really like about this cover is this is actually the cover from a Who bootleg called Tales from the Who. Oh, interesting. And so um, I scanned the cover, and then uh, I do a lot of graphic design as well. And so, you know, I kind of manipulated it. And uh, I put a quote, one of Larry's lyrics on the side from Pinto Pony, going to get VD in lame VB on the side here. On on the original, it said something else, of course. Um, But the name of the song is Picture My Face, which is a teenage head cover. And I thought that was kind of appropriate that that was Larry uh, (laughs) as the monster and picturing his face. So, and then Andrea claims that she did the uh, artwork for this one. This one came out on Safety Pin. Uh, in Spain, um, Kike Termix, rest in peace. Uh, he also did a 7-inch for Adam West, so I was very proud. In fact, I think I met Kike through uh, my connection to bands like Candy Snatchers, uh, Natural Pussy, and that thing. Uh, this is the one that came out on Get Hip. Ugly on the inside. There's another Black Lung and Wrong and Pleasures one. Did you do this one too? Great. Survival of the Fittest. I think this is the split with Nashville Pussy. Not exactly super fond of that artwork, but a hey, hey, bump and Silas. Hey, you guys do what you want. Sure, back to the label. <laughs> and this is one that came out um, pretty, pretty late. I think this was one of the last ones that was released. And this is a couple songs from their last album, Down to Lila's. And uh, this might have even come out um, after Matthew passed away. And I just wanted to throw in the Crumbs record that was Larry's other band that I did on Fandango, so...
was always a record collector. And so one of the bands I remember, I, I just loved the name. I was going through um, a big batch of 45s in some record store. I don't even remember where it was. It might, might have been up in New York, but they were called the Candy Snatchers. And uh, I thought the name was great. And on the cover, it was this really cheap black and white cover with this guy uh, with blood pouring down his face, uh, which turned out to be Larry May, of course. And uh, I had never heard of them. Uh, and I bought it simply on the aesthetic of the seven inch. And I thought that was cool. And when I got it home, of course, my, my life was changed because all of a sudden it was like, wow, here is a band. This guy's screaming his balls off. Uh, they're playing the kind of music I like to hear, and they're contemporary. I'm not listening to some 60s garage band, or I'm not listening to, like, DMZ or some band that broke up sometime in the 70s. Uh, and then I found out that they were literally just a couple hours south of me um, in the Norfolk, Virginia Beach area, which, honestly, I had never even been to before. I had been to Richmond a couple times uh, to see some shows. Uh, we used to drive down there maybe, like, early college to see a show here and there. Uh, because the tendency in Washington, D.C. was bands would just skip right over Washington, D.C. This is just not a rock town, at least when I was growing up. Um, bands, uh, they were touring northbound. They would usually play Richmond and then go right to Baltimore or Philadelphia. So D.C. just did not have a rock scene uh, when I was uh, at this time in the 90s. So anyway, it was just like, wow, finding about cool bands like the Candy Snatchers, uh, Nine Pound Hammer, New Bomb Turks, all these kind of bands, the Humpers from California. These bands were all kind of like-minded. And so I made a conscious effort, uh, DIY type of thing, uh, to try to do it myself. So I form Adam West, we start playing shows, and I start reaching my hand out to these other kind of bands and say, hey, come to Washington, you know, I'm going to guarantee you'll have a place to stay, you'll get a case of beer, we might not make any money, but there are going to be a lot of people there, we're going to have fun, blah, blah, blah. So I started doing that, and it was fairly successful. And then I meet my friend, uh, my heterosexual life partner. His name is Dave Champion. Um, he lives in Stockholm right now. He's a Canadian. But he was working here in D.C., also a huge rock and roll fan. And I think it was fate that the two of us got together. Um, I have to say I have to give Dave Champion full-on props. He's the one who really turned me on to the Candy Snatchers outside of just my having this 7-inch. Um, he actually knew them. He had already been going down to... Uh, the Norfolk area and meeting all these cool people and meeting the guys from like the M80s and knowing the guys from Black Lung and uh, he knew Steve Bass from the Devil Dogs and things like that and I was like oh my god you know you have to take me down there you have to introduce me so I think by the time we uh, I met Dave in either late 96 or early 97 I, we were already going down to Virginia Beach together and uh, the first time I went down there we were going to see some band, I can't remember what it was, at Friar Tux in Norfolk. And that's where I met Matthew Oditis and uh, Andrea Rizzo. Hi, Andrea. Um, and uh, Dave was already friends with them. And uh, one thing I was impressed with, how friendly everybody was, how accepting everybody was. This is not, was not the way it was in D.C. In D.C., there was major attitude. You walk into a room and everybody's like checking you out and judging you. And it's just, it's just a totally different vibe. And I felt so... I was honored, and I was like, wow, these people like just immediately became friends with me. And of course, the rest of the night is kind of a blur. The time I formed Adam West in, uh, in the early 90s, I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to release uh, a 7-inch. And I formed Fandango Records literally with the intention of releasing one 7-inch, my own band 7-inch. And, you know, it sold out, and it was so exciting, you know, to do the artwork and, the, and to have the actual piece of vinyl in your hand and that. And I got addicted to it. And so Fandango grew. I started doing more 7 Inches for my own band and then reaching out to other bands. And I figured, you know, why not? Why not do 500 7 Inches for uh, other bands? And so, of course, I reached out to the Candy Snatchers, and I said, hey, you guys want to do a split? And a split 7 Inches is a great way to uh, promote your band, but also promote the other band with each other's fans. So there were a lot of people around here who had never heard of the Candy Snatchers at the time, and so obviously a lot of people had never heard of Adam West. Let's do a Candy Snatchers Adam West split. And so we did that. So it was one song each. Uh, I pressed it on Fandango. I did 500, did some on colored vinyl, of course. Sold out immediately. People were still asking me for that single. Um, and then it was cool reaching out to all kinds of other bands. Um, um, Larry had another band at the time called The Crumbs, uh, so I did a four-song seven-inch for them. And then I reached out overseas to other bands, and so like the whole rock and roll thing really um, 
became a global kind of thing, especially with the advent of the internet. It's kind of like, you know, it's all connected kind of thing. You know, uh, the influence became global. And, I, and through Fandango, I was able to release records from all these other bands, especially from Sweden and things like that. And uh, what was really cool was uh, when the Helicopters, a great Swedish band uh, I became friends with, came over here for the first time, and they played in Baltimore at the old Auto Bar, which was a great haunt that the Candy Snatchers and Adam West used to play. I remember Larry are coming up. I believe uh, Matthew might have come up as well. I don't remember exactly, who, but this contingency from Norfolk and Virginia Beach came up to Baltimore uh, to see the Helicopters, and we were there. And, you know, Nubon Turks would play. Anyway, it was just kind of thing. You run into these people, and it really was a community. You know, it was a family, and we all helped each other. And I think we all loved each other, and we all did what we could. And uh, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I'm 44 years old now, and uh, it still warms my heart, you know, to think about that cool stuff. And, and I can still reach out. The fact that I'm sitting here right now, you know, all these years later, and, uh, you know, I'm still friends with Andrew. I'm still friends with all these people. I think that means a lot. I think it really does. It means that you know, we, all, we all did something and we're all still doing something uh, significant. This is one of the things I have so much respect for that band because that band, you know, so much shit happened to them over the years and, you know, inevitably someone would be, you know, either they get in some huge fight or someone would be fucked up, you know, on something beforehand or someone would have a broken leg or so something terrible would happen right before the show. But that band would get on stage and they were either the best band in the world that night or they were the worst band in the world that night. But the point was they were always a great show. The first time I saw that band might have been up in New York uh, before I even met them officially. And I don't think they got through one song before the bass exploded, someone threw a bottle, guitar blew up, fight on stage, Larry absolutely drunk out of his mind, crowds just, I mean, the place is absolutely packed, and Larry's just sitting there, you know, telling stories. You know, I always likened him to kind of like a Charles Bukowski, just on his feet, absolutely some of the incredible stories and the charisma. And it was one of the best Candy Snatcher show I ever saw. And I said, I don't even think they got through one song before it was just complete chaos. That's what I'm saying, you know. But going down the Route 44 for this Halloween show, I don't know. Surge was somewhere they couldn't find him. Larry was working behind the bar in that kind of side room from where the stage was. You know, and he's like, he's covered in all this makeup. And it's hot as balls down there inside. And so the makeup's all smearing. And he's making drinks. And um, there was... Um, um, hefty bags, trash bags over the monitors because so much shit was always spilled on the monitor. Anyway, it was, just the whole thing looked like it was going to be a fucking train wreck. And I was so amazed that it was like time for the Kenny Sessions to go on. Well, obviously, it was f probably 45 minutes to an hour after they were supposed to go on. But anyway, three of them go up there. Uh, Willie, Matthew, and Serge start playing the song. It probably was like no time to waste, you know, start... I'm like, where the hell is Larry? Larry was like finishing up a drink behind the bar and somehow like swung his body around, got on stage and hit the mic right when the first line of the first verse. And it was, the place went berserk. And of course I'm right in front and I'm getting pushed and everything. And it was just like, this is, it's just magical. It was just, there was always a magic with those guys. Um, and then afterwards, uh, upstairs, the guy who owned Roo Fru for actually had a party on the upstairs, kind of a private party. And I don't know how private it was because it seemed like everybody from the show just went upstairs.